Hey guys, welcome back. We are on our next part of this series on the parables of Jesus. This one comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 18. So if you have your Bibles, let's go there. Matthew chapter 18, and we're going to read verses 21 through 35. So if you have your Bibles, let's be there. 21. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall I my brother sin against me, and I forgive him. Up to seven times? And so Peter is asking this, this question of how often he should forgive maybe one of the other disciples or someone else. And, and I think we look at this and we think, oh, you know, he's just counting how many. Well, the scribes and Pharisees during that time of a period of history, their amount was three kind of like in baseball, three strikes and, and you're out. And, and this is how they would treat people. If they, someone comes and does something to them and they would forgive them and they would come and do it again and they would forgive them. And then the third time, that would be it. And after that, no more forgiveness. But is that how we ought to be? And so I think Peter is being generous here. He's saying, you know what? What about seven times? This is more than double. And seven in the Bible is this, this symbol of, of perfection, of, of completeness. And so notice what Jesus says. He says to him in verse 22, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Now, that's quite a few, isn't it? 70 times seven is, is 490 And if you know about Bible prophecy, there was a period in time where God gave Israel 490 years to choose to follow him or not. And this is the close, and when Jesus is saying this, this is almost the closing of this time. 70 times 7, 490 times. Would we have that much forgiveness? Would we have that much forgiveness to someone? that would do something to us 490 times? Would would you? So Jesus, to to drive this point home, he gives us this, this parable. He says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. You know, make sure they were paying up what they owed. And when he had begun to settle his accounts, one was brought to him, who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, 10,000 talents is about 600, or sorry, 6,000 denarii. A denarii is about uh, uh, one day's wages. And so 10,000 talents would be 160,000 years of wages. Okay? That's, that's quite a large sum. He owed this much. And, and in today's dollars, if, if you say someone makes, let's say, $30,000 a year, it's close to $5 billion. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of debt. If you go and look at the Forbes um, list of people that um, have the, their greatest net worth, You have to scroll all the way down to like 500 some. And then you get to someone that their net worth is worth 5 billion. There are people that have over 200 billion dollars of net worth. So they could maybe pay. But most people, I mean, you have to be on the top 500 list of people of net worth in the world. And so here... Could he repay this amount? Verse 25 says no. But he was not able to pay. His master commanded that that he be sold, he with his, his wife and children and all that he had, and that payment be made. The servant, therefore, 
fell down before him and saying, Master, have patience with me and I will repay you all. I mean, five billion (laughs) dollars? That's that's a lot to repay. How can you do so? Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. Guys, this is us. We cannot repay, can we? The wages of sin is death. We're on we're on death row. But God gives us mercy. He has compassion on us and forgives us. And forgives the debt. He doesn't say, I'll just give you time to work it off. He he forgives it. And so what should well up in us? Well, gratitude should well up in us. But that's not what happened. Verse 28 says, But, this word that changes everything, but that master went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. This is around 8,000-ish dollars. A hundred days wages. And he said, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe. Now, did he need this money? I mean, maybe he didn't have anything. He was in debt to the other guy, but that had been repaid or or, uh, forgiven. And he laid his hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you all. Could he repay this debt? I mean, it might take some time, but this is something within grasp. And he would not. But he went and threw him in prison till he should pay the debt. This instance, this story, this this situation should have rung in the ear of him who had just been forgiven, but no. So when his fellow servants saw what he had done, what had been done, they were very grieved, the other people, and came and told their master what had been done. And his master, then his master, after him, he called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you begged me. Should you not also have compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on on you? Isn't that the question? I think that's the question for us. That's what this parable for Peter was, was if we've been forgiven this big debt, shouldn't we then pass that along? His master was very angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay what all that was due him. I'm not sure that ever worked out. Verse 35, so my heavenly father also will do to you if each of each of you from this from his heart, does not forgive his brother his trespasses. This is serious business, guys. If, if we don't have forgiveness in our heart towards others, like God has had forgiveness towards us, we won't appreciate the forgiveness that God gives us. So we should be passing it along. Now this, this other servant or, that owed the, the hundred denarii he, he could have paid it back. But in this little thing, he didn't have mercy. There's two other instances in the Bible that I want to look at that deal with this same thing, this same kind of story, this concept of forgiveness. So if you have your Bibles, let's go to the book of John chapter 8. John chapter 8 and verse 1 it says but jesus went to the mount of olives now early in the morning he came into the temp again into the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them then then the scribes and the pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery and when they had set her in the midst they said to him teacher this woman was caught in adultery in the very act red-handed Now Moses, in the law, commanded us that such should be stoned. But what say you? They're trying to to trap him here, right? This they said, testing him, that they should have something of which to accuse him. 
but Jesus. Wiser, but Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. He ignored this, this accusation or, or let's, let's go and stone her. So when they continued asking, he raised himself up and said to them, he who, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And they're thinking, okay, let's grab these stones. And then they're thinking, wait a minute. He who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. What about that thing I did? I, oh, I, I better, I'm going to leave. And this is what happened. Then those who were heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. It was just the woman and Jesus left. And when Jesus raised himself up, he saw and saw no one but the woman. He said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has, has no one condemned you? And so Jesus, remember, he's stooping down. I don't know what he's writing. Maybe he's writing what they were doing in the ground. I'm not sure. But according to Jesus' um, criteria, who's left to stone her? Is anyone left? Remember, he said he was without sin. Well, Jesus was without sin. She says, no one, these accusers are gone. No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, the one that could have by all justification, has said, hey, I'm, I'm without sin. I can toss this stone at you. But, but he doesn't. He says, neither do I condemn you. The one who could have doesn't. Neither do I condemn you. Forgiveness. But forgiveness isn't just a blank check to do whatever we want. Forgiveness is going to change our heart. And so he says there, Neither do I condemn you. Go and go and, and sin no more. There's a life change. The, this one that was forgiven the, the 10,000 talents, he should have gone and, and sinned no more, gone and, and carried that forgiveness to others, but didn't. Do you think this woman's life was changed? I think so. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. I think there's something to forgiveness. Something also to being forgiven that changes our life. One last person and story I want to look at. It comes from two parts of the Bible. One in the book of Acts chapter 7. So if we have our Bibles, let's go there. Acts 7 and verse 54 Stephen, one of the followers of Jesus, was on trial. And he had had this big sermon, and they didn't like it. Conviction set in, and and anger came out. It says, when they had heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God, and said, look, I see the heavens opened. And the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. He sees God. And notice what happens right after this. They cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named who? Saul. We'll get to him in a second. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice. Notice this, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He he died. So let me ask you this. Did Stephen have reason not to forgive or have hard feelings towards these people throwing rocks at him? Would that be justifiable? I mean, I think I would justify it. 
But he had just seen the face of Jesus. He had seen God and, and what it, it changed his heart. It says there that he says, don't charge them with this sin. Remember who is standing there? A guy named Saul. You've heard this story. Let's go to Acts chapter 9. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters of, from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed near Damascus, suddenly a light shone around him from heaven, and he fell on the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who, who, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom, whom you are persecuting. It is, it is hard for you to kick against the goats. He realized he was persecuting Jesus, not literally, but the, his followers. He realized that Jesus was alive and that he was in the wrong what if Stephen wouldn't have said, don't hold this against them? Would Jesus have gone after Saul? Saul is realizing what he's done. So he, verse 6, trembling, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? I think when we see God's mercy, this should be our question. What do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Rise, go into the city, and you will be told what to do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. And then Saul rose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor, nor drank. Verse 10. Now there was a certain disciple in, at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. This is a good response, right? So the Lord said to him, arise, go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hands on him so that he might receive his sight. So, then Ananias, oh, verse 13, answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. He's heard about Saul. Maybe he heard about the, the stoning of Stephen and how he was there holding the jackets and taking the easy job. But was there reason for hard feelings and fear? There was maybe reason for this. It hadn't been done to him, but he had heard about it. And he was holding it against Saul. But God's telling him here, Saul is, is praying and had seen in a vision that you, you're coming to him to help him. But the Lord said to him, go, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And so Ananias is saying here, what do I do? Well, oh God, you're telling me he's, he's going to be one of us? I don't want to. I don't want to forgive because of what he did to others. I think the question for us is, God gives us forgiveness, right? He gives us forgiveness, but we want justice for everyone else. But this is not what Ananias did. It says here, and Ananias went. 
his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and he received his sight at once. Not only that, it says, and he arose and was baptized. His life was changed from there out, then out, and, and is started being a missionary and changing the world. Most of the New Testament is written from Paul. But what if Ananias didn't have this forgiving heart towards Saul? What if the king didn't have a forgiving spirit. Forgiveness is a powerful thing. We see how it affects us, like we can't repay, and so God forgives our debt. But then someone else, we, we want them to pay. I think there's a connection between the gratitude we have towards what God does for us and the forgiveness that we have towards others. And so how are we forgiving? How are we extending this forgiveness and patience and kindness and, and pointing them to, to, to Jesus? How are we doing that? What does that look like in action? When God asks us to do something hard, like, like go talk to Saul, or forgive someone that's hurt others, what do we do? I think we go like Ananias did and go and, and say, brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. God's been praying for you. We've been praying for you. God wants to do something powerful in your life. Let's pray. God, help us to forgive in response to you forgiving us because we cannot repay just like that servant could not repay. And so let us, in gratitude, extend that forgiveness to others. In your name, amen. Hey guys, thanks for being with me. Next week, we'll have another one. So go from here and, and forgive as Christ forgave us.